Hey everybody, welcome back to the Plays and Fades YouTube channel. I'm your host, Gordo Gambles. Today we are back talking about another full card breakdown, this time for UFC Vegas 75. We are back at the Apex after what was a historical weekend at uh, in Canada, up in Vancouver, with six Canadian fighters winning it. It was a, an event that I could talk about for a while, especially from a impact perspective. But, uh, you know, if we want to briefly cover the whole betting thing, I, I bet against a Canadian, it didn't go my way. And then DraftKings-wise, it was pretty good. My major combination ended up coming through, but I, I didn't have enough Sahabi. And again, is that fading a Canadian? Could be either way. They were on fire. Fun weekend. It's time to move on. We're back at the apex. It's not as electric, but we still have ourselves a nice fight card. 14 fights to be exact. And it's actually one that's pretty sneaky. And uh, a, a lot of good underdogs, I think, are alive. And a lot of very interesting matchups that I'm happy to break down from both a betting and DraftKings perspective. So please, before we get started, hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. Let's do this. First fight of the night, we have the 6-1 Zach Pauga taking on the 14-5 Modeskis Bukaukas. And this is a, a fun fight at 205. And, well, not really. Uh, well, first of all, it, it usually I record these videos like Tuesday night, stuff like that. It, it is Wednesday morning. It's a, it's a coffee type uh, video for this one. So me saying this fight's a fun one is kind of incorrect because this ha probably has lower potential for a fun matchup in this card. Uh, when we look at the side of Odessa Bukaukas, I think he's a very technical striker, someone who is going to be uh, a decent prospect here in terms of I think he does have potential, but the truth is with him is he only averages 3.37 uh, strikes per minute, only at a 38% accuracy, and the guy can be hit. The truth is, although he is very good technically, he's low volume, and he fights these really close decisions because of it, and in addition to not having any wrestling equity, the guy's going to be in a lot of close fights, and this Zach Pauka guy is not someone I'm the highest on. I mean, he took Jordan Wright to a decision last time or something you don't want to see, but what he does have is decent volume. I mean, he averages 4.42 per minute, and he has decent clinch control and grappling. So in a matchup where you have Modestus Bukaukas, who is going to be um, the better technical striker, and I think the guy with more um, ability, he's not going to have the best stylistic magic pair, in my opinion, because I don't think he has enough volume to compete with someone like Zach Pauga in the optics. Does that mean I'm picking Zach Pauga? Well, not really. I, I don't want to because the, the guy doesn't have the best chin, in my opinion. I don't think he has the best technical striking, but what he does have is good volume, pressure, and cage control. And against a guy like Bokaukas, I do think that'll work. At range, I think it is Modeskis all day. I do think he does have more finish equity as well as really the harder strikes, but optically, it doesn't really favor him here. So what does that mean for this matchup? Well, it means I think the line's wide. In the betting market, seeing Modest Bokaukas at minus 180, minus 200 doesn't really sit right with me because I don't think you has that same dominant path to victory that a lot of people would like to see from minus 200 favorite. If this was minus 110, minus 110, sure, I'd take the technicality of Bukaukas and the, the power threat to go out there and maybe get a win, but what is this wide? I don't see much uh, faith in him for me to go out there and back him at this price tag, especially at this 9K price tag on DraftKings where this Bukauskas guy is content to put up a 51-point decision in his last win. So although I don't mind Bodestas as a, a person or a technical fighter, I don't think necessarily he should be warranted of this larger price tag. And I also don't think that he should be someone you should be going out there and roster at 9K. Instead, I think it's more a sign of the dog. I mean, Pauga has the ability to clinch against the cage. I think he has this uh, ability to make this fight close. Now, that doesn't mean I'm picking Pauga. I'm going to still pick Bukowskis for the win here, but I would be careful parlaying or playing someone like Modestus who does get in these really, really close fights, and it could be dicey over the stretch here. Not my most interesting fight on DraftKings, but one I'm really looking to see uh, to see how these fighters are progressing and see how we can back them in the future. All right, where that last one lacked a bit of excitement, this one brings it right here. 9-1 Daniel Argueta versus the 8-2 Ronnie Lawrence. This is a very, very fun fight and one of my most highly anticipated matchups of this card because it's Ronnie Lawrence. I am a huge fan of Ronnie Lawrence and his style, mainly because, you know, DraftKings player first, and this guy is DraftKings gold. He won two fights in the UFC, he scored 131 and 134. The guy is a dynamic fighter, and the reason he scores so well in DraftKings is because of his wrestling. Ronnie Lawrence averages 7.03 takedowns land per 15 minutes. He's a high-paced grappler, and landing at a 77% accuracy, the guy can grapple pretty well. Not the best control, but when you have the cardio and the pace and the takedown upside to do it over and over again, you don't really need that control. It allows you for a higher draft from scores. Flip side of things, Dan Argueta, he's also a wrestler, averages 2.5 takedowns for 15 minutes. He does like to fight at a higher pace, but what we see from this is when we have these two wrestlers, how does their striking look? And uh, really, 2.88 strikes landed per minute for Lawrence, 2.47, very low volume because they want to grapple so much. And although sometimes we see these wrestlers counter each other out and it usually ends up in a striking battle, not here. Ronnie Lawrence isn't afraid of anybody. He's going to go in there, sometimes to his own detriment because he did lose that fight, last fight to Sajikov Kakramanov, but he's a wrestler at heart and he's going to keep doing that over and over again against a guy, Daniel Regretta, who has been taken down, who has been controlled. I think we have some really good upside here for someone in Ronnie Lawrence. If you guys can't tell already, I really like Ronnie Lawrence. I mean, a, a guy with this much wrestling upside, a guy who I think has fought the battle of 
competition as well. And a guy I think is hungry, I think he should have the edge here against someone in Daniel Argueta. Lawrence was minus 150. I missed out on that. I took a shot on Ronnie Lawrence at minus 175. I do think that's where you can get some value on this one because I do think he wins this fight at a decent clip. DraftKings wise though at 8.7 he does probably have the highest ceiling on the slate like I mentioned already some over 130 point scores the guy's a very dynamic fighter on DraftKings and he has that style to succeed and do very well so I'm on the favorite here and not not too much of a spicy take here I think Ronnie Lawrence is able to get back to his winning ways I think he's able to go back out there with a high pace wrestling heavy approach it's gonna score well on DraftKings and he's gonna win in this fight I usually don't like have my eggs in one basket with the uh, high owned fighter on DraftKings and the betting line but I'm doing it here. I, I am a fan of Ronnie Lawrence. I do think he has the an insane DraftKings ceiling at 8.7, and he is someone I think you're going to be looking to roster this weekend. Flip side of things with Dan Argetta, do I see that much of a uh, that much upside? Can he outgrapple Lawrence? Well, if he does, it could score well. But I really, I I am on the Lawrence side here. I think Argetta is nothing but a pivot nothing about a very good contrarian play considering how chalky lawrence is going to be but if you're playing multiple entries getting to someone like argetta could be very contrarian could allow you to get to that higher paid position next up six and one to reza bleda versus the eight and two gabriella fernandez we got ourselves the uh, sole female fight in the card i think yeah sole female fight in the card and one that's actually a pretty fun one i mean Teresa bleda was someone who i was decently high on uh, i bet on her as a big underdog against talia silva and she had success but you know it, it's not never the best idea to bet against italia silva Solo. he's seen how dangerous she can be and the flip side of things Gabriela Fernandez she was highly touted coming in and I backed my girl Jasmine Jazzy Vicious against her last time and Jasmine was a dog she dominated in the grappling exchange and she really implemented what was a big glaring hole in the game of Gabriela Fernandez is she can't really work off her back and she can be taken down and when we have a matchup like this where we have a primary wrestler versus someone who has such a large hole in his game that's kind of where the line is why it is it's uh, Teresa Bleda being a large favorite and I think it's because of that huge grappling upside Flip side of things, though, we saw Blada struggle in the feet as, uh, coming down the stretch. I mean, I think she does have some good fundamental striking, but she can be obstruct. I mean, she was knocked out last time when her cardio waned. And one thing Gabriela Fernandez does have is some good power and some good technicality on the feet, which leads us to a very, very fun fight. I saw this line at the under was at like plus 200 or something like that. I, I do think that was a good way to go, but I missed out on it. Instead, how do we look to target this fight? Well, maybe some DraftKings equity. Teresa Bleda is a lot more expensive than I'd like her to see, but at 9.5K, she does have a good, very clear path to victory with her takedowns and her finish upside. I mean, Fernando's is able to survive all 15 minutes with Jasmine, but I think Blade is more of a violent finisher. I mean, she has some good elbows on tops and very good ground and pound, passes into Mount pretty easily. And I do think she could have a good opportunity to finish this fight. 9.5K, very expensive. But a decent cash and high floor play, in my opinion. If Fernandez wants to win this fight, she's going to have to have strike from range and stuff. The takedown, something I haven't seen from her yet, which is why I, I do think it is Blade's season here. The main win criteria for Fernandez is going to be Blade gassing out, Fernandez surviving early on, and looking to implement an Italia Silva approach, knocking out Teresa Blade later on. Don't see it happening to have a click, but I'm not going to run it out. Uh, instead, give me Blade, though. Give me her to win us at a distance. Uh, she is someone I think wins at a pretty high clip scoring a few takedowns and looking good in the process. Next up, Zalga Zamagulis, Master Z, 14 and eight versus the 13 and six Felipe Funes. Uh, a decently fun fight. We finally get to see Zalgas back in the cage at 8.5K on DraftKings. He's never been the most appealing option. And although he's a, a fun fighter who's getting this internet personality going, the truth is, this guy's been a split decision and a robbery kick. I mean, there's sure there should have been a couple of fights that he should have won, but he's fighting in these really close fights against everybody. Molina, Johnson, and Paiva, three fights that went to decision and could have gone really either way. I mean, the, the guy is able to fight in these really close fights, and his style leaves him to be at the mercy of the judges. Let's put it that way. And I do like Master Z, but getting a guy here in Felipe Burns who is dynamic as he is, I don't think he has to worry about that. Because someone in Felipe Burns is someone who I see, Burns, sorry, Bunes, is someone who I like to see being a primary grappler. Someone who likes to fight off his back, someone with a very, very good submission game. But not someone who I see winning the minutes too often, and I think that's kind of where Zog is going to get the edge. I think when it comes to on the feet, the the volume, the technicality, and the pressure, maybe even the wrestling, it's going to be someone like Zaga Zamagulis, but does he want to take it there when the guy he's facing is such a good submission grappler? Well, probably not. And instead, it's going to be up to Zalgas to win these exchanges on the feet against a guy who's a decently competent striker in Bunez, but not one who wants to be there too often. I think really the guy with more finish equity is going to be Bunez here because I do think he has the ability to, to find a submission or even use his, his striking from range. Whereas Zalgas is more going to need to use that clinch. He's going to need to use that getting inside the pocket and winning on volume. He's going to need to win a decision. So 
who do you want more? Someone who's going to win a decision in Zagas or someone who's going to be in a finish with Bunes? That's why Bunes is going to be a live underdog for me at 7.7k. My Masters, he's been pretty good at slowing down these fights and uh, staying out of trouble, especially on the mat. And uh, I think that this is something that is going to he's going to have to do here against Bunes because Bunes is pretty dangerous for that reason. More upside to Bunes, although the pick is going to be Master Z with some cage control. Should be an interesting fight, but whenever Master Z is fighting, he's not the highest priority drafting target. More Bunes on DraftKings, pick still going to be Zalgas. Next up, 8-2, Carlos Fernandez versus the 16-4, Dennis Bondar. This is the hardest fight for me to choose on this card because I haven't seen much from Dennis Bondar. I mean, he came on the scene against Malcolm Gordon, Canadian GOAT, and uh, he lost. I mean, he got, his, he got his elbow dislocated, he didn't really get to see that play out, but the point was we didn't really learn anything from him here there. He's still a guy who has fought this questionable level of competition on the regional scene, someone who has exceeded and with good flying colors, but we haven't really seen him tested. We haven't really seen a lot of aspects of this game when he's getting this level of competition. And against a guy in Carlos Hernandez, we're going to see him tested a bit more here. Hernandez is a very high volume striker, 4.93 strikes landed per minute, decent accuracy, and uh, a guy who I think is going to be winning these striking exchanges from what I can see here. But the big question mark is that grappling defense because someone at Denny's Bondar who is going to be shooting at a very high clip who is a very capable grappler and once someone wants to get it to the ground it's a guy with a questionable takedown defense in Carlos Hernandez well it's not something you really want to see although there's all these questions the one thing I know for sure is Dennis Bondar is a dangerous dangerous man on the ground and Carlos is gonna to have to mind his p's and q's leads me kind of to a similar breakdown as last time is that if Carlos Hernandez is going to win this fight it's probably not going to come at the highest ceiling so the better drafting option is to be Bondar because he does have round one round two finish equity and especially against a guy in Carlos Hernandez who shows that poor takedown defense, Bondar is going to be live to get that early submission. For that reason, Bondar is going to be the better DraftKings option, but when it comes to picking a winner, the most likely outcome, in my opinion, is Hernandez, who's been historically durable. He's going to be able to get back up, work his way to the feed, and outstrike Bondar for the later rounds, maybe even getting a finish at Bondar later on when we haven't really seen that cardio tested. So Bondar is this huge wild card. He's this huge elephant who's going to go in there and he's going to go balls to the wall, try to get that take, try to get that finish. And although he could get it, he's less reliable. I think Carlos Hernandez has more of an edge in the striking and the minute winning ability. And for that reason, I'm going to have to go with Hernandez. Although I think that Bondar is going to be the way higher on DraftKings target for me, especially due to his high finish equity. Uh, very similar to that last one. Uh, although another one I'm going to want to sit back to learn from these fighters here. But um, pick as Hernandez due to his uh, get up game in high volume versus the uh, DraftKings side. Uh, Bondar due to his high, high upside equity. Next up, 18 and 9, Kung Ho Kang versus the 18 and 3, Christian Crinones. And uh, we have another very large favorite here uh, on the betting line, Christian Crinones at, well, I guess it's now minus 163. And uh, uh, it, when I saw this line open up originally, I thought this was a, a, a pretty big case of the recency biases. I uh, wonder if we saw Christian Crinones have a decent, very, very decent performance last time out, and people are choosing him to do that again. But I still haven't seen much from Christian Crinones. Sure, he knocked out Kalitaha in brutal fashion last time, but I haven't really seen his his game fully play out. How can he be on the ground? How can he be against his high level of competition down the stretch? How does he face adversity? There's still a lot of questions to be answered about Quinones. And is Kang the type of guy to do that? That's what we really get to see because Although Kang's got a victory himself, he, he's a guy who has this grappling in his back pocket. He's a guy who averages over two takedowns per 15 minutes, 11 of his 18 wins by submission. We know this guy has a capable ground game, but on the feet, I don't think he's too poor either. Some decent volume, decent technicality, and some pretty decent power. I mean, he's landed a few knockdowns. I think this guy has a decent, well-rounded skill set. The big red flags, though, is he can be outstruck on the feet, and he changes the fade down the stretch. But against a guy in Quinones, who we haven't really seen much from, this is another really interesting matchup that I can't really get the strongest of read on. My pick though, I'm gonna have to go with the dog here in Kang. I, I, I think that although Quinones has been super dangerous with these strikes, Kang has been durable and he is a guy who has the takedown upside. I mean, he's landed a th uh, three takedowns in a few of his fights recently. I think he's gonna have the ability to push a pace here early on and bank the first couple rounds. And sure, it can be dicey, but I haven't really seen the full product of Christian Quinones. Another one of these fights where I wanna take a step back and gather information, but I'm gonna take a shot in the dog. I think he has more paths to victory here. And although Quinones has shown a decent offensive striking skill set, that's really what I'm limited to right now. And I'm gonna have to learn more about the guy in the process. DraftKings wise, with the takedowns, Mr. Perfect Kang is a guy who's going to be a live underdog at 7.4K. I do think he has some decent upside to go out there, stifle the, the striking offense of Quinones. I don't see that much on the Quinones side. 8.8, I think there's so many live underdogs. And when you're sandwiched between Lawrence and Torres, a, a guy who's going to be a primary striker against a guy who has shown decent durability, 
I don't see the, as high of a ceiling or a floor from Quinones, so more of a fade on the DraftKings perspective here. Give me the underdog. Should be a close fight here, close in the line and tails at least. I'm just going to take the guy with more paths to victory, and I hope Kang implements his wrestling and really gives us a, a, a breakdown of what Quinones really is. Next up, 16-6 and six, Jimmy Flick versus the 12-3 and three, Alessandro Costa. One of my favorite fights of the card and a really easy one to break down. Jimmy Flick is a fantastic grappler, one of the best grapplers we've seen inside the cage. He's the guy who got that flying triangle. He's got a ton of great grappling abilities, and he's someone who's very fun to watch, but he took a three-year retirement. He's back for a paycheck, and we saw that in full against Johnson his last time out. He's a guy who wants to come out here, wants to rip your head off and round one with the submission, or he's going to fade. He's going to take the easy way out. I I'm really puzzled to see why he's back in the octagon, because although he's super fun to watch, he doesn't seem to want to be in there after three minutes. If he can't get that early submission, he fades on the stretch. If there's any striking exchanges, he doesn't like that adversity. To me, he's not the most appealing option. The truth is, though, every time he's out there, you have to be wary of a first-round submission because that's going to score great on draft because it happens. And in this case here, when he's at 6.8K, he has slate-breaking potential. But I don't mind this Alessandro Costa kid. Uh, he's got a great submission game in his own right. He, he's got some great hands, great technicality. And I think he has the overall well-rounded skill set to take out someone like Jimmy Flick as this fight goes on. And I think this is another one that's going to end inside the first seven and a half minutes. Under one and a half is very, very live here. This is one of my favorite fights to target on DraftKings. Yes, Jimmy Flick is always live for a submission round one. That's going to score great. That's going to break the slate at 6.8. But... A large majority of the time, Costa's going to take over and he's going to finish Jimmy Flick pretty early. And I think in doing so, it's going to score very well. Costa has the volume. He has the pressure. He has the way better striking. And I do think he gets him out of there early. Costa is one of my favorite um, DraftKings plays on the slates. 9.4K, very expensive, but he does have some pretty good upside. And when his opponent is pretty much there for a check, I do think he has the ability to get him out of there and score pretty well in the process. Again, not counting out Flick, but I do really like myself some Costa this weekend. This is a fight you're going to want to have. And the prelim headliner, 17-4, Rione Barcelos versus the 13-2, Miles Johns. Another very fun fight. Rione Barcelos, extremely talented, very well-rounded skill set. Um, lost last time to Romano Magomedov, which was expected with the salary we had there. But Barcelos is dangerous, man. And I, I love his well-rounded skill set. It's a shame he's had a few losses in the UFC because I do think he has all the tools to be very successful. But what's scary here is that last knockout loss was he wasn't he got out there and dominated by Umar on the, on the ground and taken down. He got knocked out cold pretty bad and at this point of his career when he is an older fighter it's harder to back him at this huge favorite price tag when we've seen that happen to him recently the truth is though he has a much more rounded well-rounded skill set here he should win this fight at a high clip better striker better grappler solid wrestling i think barcelos is a very very talented young man older man actually sorry and i do think he wins this fight at a pretty high clip but johns does have power johns does have some decent wrestling in his past and we have seen barcelos fade down the stretch so when you have a fighter although he's super super talented does have the best cardio or durability it's hard to back at a favorite price tag truth is though barcelos should win this fight i mean barcelos at 9.3 is another decent option because he has taken an upside striking upside and wins this fight at a high clip in my opinion but the dart throw of dart throws is miles johns because if he wins this fight it's gonna be by knockout it's gonna be exposing the shit of ourselves, which I don't think happens too often, but when it does, should come out low ownership and score pretty well. Either way, though, I'm taking Barcelos. I think he's the much more well-rounded fighter. I think he gets this done a lot of the time. I'm just a bit worrisome to want to parlay him this at this stage of his career. But I do think he gets back on track here. I do think he wins this fight. A decent payup option. Although, again, hard to get to him when you have people like Costa and Blade up there. So taking Barcelos, do think he wins. But be 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 careful when you're when you're betting him in your parlays just due to that uh, that deteriorating chin at that older age. Next up, 19 and three Muslim Salah covers the 21 and four Nicholas Dalby. Um, like this is a pass fight for me. I'm not really interested in this one too much. It's going to be a striking affair against two guys who have decent durability and who don't score that well in DraftKings. I mean, Salikov is out here putting up 82 points and wins, 80 points and win, a 46 point and win, 71 to win. Like he's not the best DraftKings player long term. And Dalby, man, Dalby is not either. He's going out there putting up. Oh, I put 94 and win last time, but 68 and a win, 54 and a win, 68 and a win. These guys are the best drafting scores. So this fight's not too appealing to me. But let's break it down to the less. Salikov is a very powerful striker. He's got most of his win by KO. Very very technical kickboxer, uh, but he he has that technicality and that power over volume. And for that reason, he doesn't really win too many of these volume based decisions. Only 3.3 .3 strikes landed per minute. And although he has a 67 percent striking defense, I mean, he's really really good in the feet. He can lose these volume based decisions. He can be pushing the cage 
can be taken down. So Salikov's a guy with holes in his game, but is a very good tactical striker. One that I think will be the better tactical striker in this bout. Dobby, though, he's more willing to push forward, use that cage to his advantage, and look to make it a really fun brawl. Uh, if Salikov's willing to keep it from range, Dobby will go in there and he'll push a pace. He'll look to push him up against the cage and use more volume, which I really couldn't say for him before, but he looks to be implementing that to his game. The truth is, neither of these fighters are really going to be rostering too much on DraftKings, and it's not a fight that I see Ending side of the distance too often, although the finish upside is on the Salikov side, it is one where I see it mostly going to decision. So is it going to be the technicality of Salikov or the pace of Dalby? And I haven't really seen full proof of Dalby going out there willing to wrestle, willing to use volume. So it's going to be the technicality and optics of Salikov to win this fight, although I'm not confident in saying that. It's not a fight I'm looking to back, not a fight I'm looking to bet, but give me Salikov by decision. Give me him to go out there, land the more damaging shots, win the optics on the scorecards and not score that well on DraftKings. Instead though, scoring well on DraftKings, 13 and four Nicholas Modas, 13 and two Manuel Torres, one of my favorite fights in the entire card. Manuel Torres is kind of like this Mike Malott style fighter. I mean, 15 fights, all of them but one ending inside the very first round. He's a killer to be killed fighter, so fun to watch. And although I don't think he's as technically gifted as Malott, when you have someone who has this first round finish upside or he can fade in this first round, He's a very, very good DraftKings player to target. Torres scored 114 in his last first round win. And although it was against an older fighter, he's getting a guy in Mata who has been knocked out before and who could be in for another very, very favorable fight to end inside the distance. Now, this fight is going to be electric for as long as it lasts. But the truth is, I don't know how long it lasts and I don't know who's going to come out victorious. Because on one side of things, although you have Manuel Torres, who is going to be the more well-rounded fighter, great power on the feet, good grappling, good submission. I mean, he's got his win spread out between submissions and knockouts. We haven't really seen him outside of the first round. We've seen him be able to be hit sometimes and he has been knocked out. So there's these holes in his game that I don't think make him too perfect. But the flip side of things, Mata has been taken down a few of his fights, has been knocked out as well. I mean, I don't think Mata's durability is that good, but he has a ton of power and we have seen him tested later on. So pick your poison, because I do think this is a very, very volatile matchup. The winner's gonna score very, very well. I just don't know who that's gonna be right now. I'm leaning toward the Torres side because he has more passive victory. Although he has the power to find Moda's chin, he also has the grappling to take it there if it gets dicey. We've seen Moda control. We've seen him um, put into precarious situations on the mat. And I do think Torres has more passive victory. The truth is he's not a safe option. Not at all. Moda has nine of his 13 wins by knockout. A ton of power. He knocked out Van Camp last time. And I do think with someone as Torres who has not the best striking defense, Moda can find the chin. It could make it for a decent upset for the $7,300 underdog on DraftKings. So either way, give me violence. It should end one way or the other. Uh, I want this fight a ton of it on DraftKings. I want to bet the under as well. But I'm not sure who's going to win. So uh, fun fight. I'm going to pick Torrey because he has more paths to victory. Uh, but both these guys are live for a very, very high score on DraftKings. Next up, 17-4 Sabatini versus the 14-1 Almeida. Another very, very fun fight. Almeida, 100% finish rate. Uh, a guy who's very, very volatile. And Pat Sabatini, a guy who we know is very, very talented, especially on the mat, especially with his grappling, coming out of a very, very good gym. A fun fight, but one where I'm leaning towards a dog. Let's get that out of the way. Let me tell you that now. Lucas Almeida is a guy I'm looking to take here, but it's dangerous because Pat Sabatini, we know, is a very good wrestler, control grappler, and solid submission grappler as well for that matter but everything he does is kind of on the mat on the feet he can be hit he can be dropped i mean he was finished last time against damon jackson he was dropped by jamal emmers his chin and his defensive striking is definitely a question for sabatini and, and i mean there's no question he's gonna be winning these grappling exchanges but can he survive not long enough to get there because almeida although he can be taken down has shown a decent get up game and he's going to be the much more volatile fighter on the feet. I mean, incredible combinations, very dominant and powerful on the feet. And I do think he'll be winning a lot of the striking exchanges. So once again, pick your poison. Are you a type of guy who likes to take these grapplers with no chins? Which sometimes I am to my own demise. Well, then take Pat Sabatini. Because he does have the grappling upside. If he wins this fight, he's going to come with a lot of takedowns, a lot of control. Maybe even a submission. One that could score decent. And the flip side of things, if you're on the Almeida side like I am, like you think he can find his chin on the feet and have enough of a get-up game or a takedown defense game to stop the shots... Well, 7.1K Almeida could be one of the better options because, I mean, he scored 102 in his only fight so far in the UFC. The guy is a very, very dangerous dude. And against a guy who hasn't been finished recently, you want to see that danger. I mean, he's a guy with very, very high upside. He's going to be one of my higher owned underdogs this week because not only do I think he wins, but if he wins, it's going to score very, very well. So give me the finish upside on Almeida to capitalize off the defensive liabilities of Sabatini. Although, he's got to make sure his takedown defense is in check because the grappling edge is for sure on the Sabatini side. Should be a fun one, but I'm going to take a shot on the dog. You know what? Let's make this back-to-back -back dog. I'm taking another shot on Armin Petrosian here against Christian Leroy Duncan. I kind of like getting it out of the way early on when I talk about it. Christian Leroy Duncan, 8-0, making his second return to the cage. Ross Petrosian, 7-2. Um, 
The truth is, we're finally getting a matchup for Petrosian that doesn't involve a grappler. And that's been what I'm looking for, it is a guy who is not really going to pose a threat towards Petrosian and really allow Petrosian to get off on his game. Because Petrosian is an incredible kickboxer, a ton of power, very good technicalities, very good defensively as well. And in a matchup like this, when you get a 15 minute kickboxing bout, in my opinion, I do think he has the optics and the technicality to beat someone like Christian Leroy Duncan. Because although Christian Leroy Duncan is well-rounded, decent ground game, ton of power on the feet, I think he lacks volume sometimes. I don't think he's the best technically, but instead he gets to use that pressure forward style a game that has worked against his lower level of competition. Now, I haven't really seen Petrosian succeed in the striking against that good of competition, but I know he has that talent. And I know in this matchup here, when I'm visualizing it, who's the guy who's gonna be winning the 15 minutes optics of the striking exchanges? Well, it's gonna be the guy landing the better shots, who's better technically, which is Armin Petrosian. And I do think he's able to beat someone like Christian Lira Duncan down the stretch in what should be a 15 minute striking affair. But for that reason, pass on DraftKings from both sides. Even though I'm picking an underdog in Petrosian, 7.6, no grappling upside. I think both these guys are decently durable, so there be no finish. I don't think the volume upside is that high either. This is a complete fade for me on DraftKings, even Duncan, um, as a guy who I don't see finishing Petrosian, who's gonna need to be winning the volume. 8.6, man, not, not very pretty. Uh, complete fade for me on DraftKings, but I'm taking the shot on the dog in Petrosian. Should be a very, very fun fight here. Even the guy who I think is just better technically. That one's a close one. This one, not so much. 19-3, Armand Suzurkian, 12-3, Joachim Silva. Uh, quickest breakdown you've got. Um, Armand Suzurkian's gonna win this fight. Uh, much better level of competition, drastic step down. Huge favorite, and it reflects that. Joachim Silva has been knocked out, he's been taken down, he's been dominated. Very weird matchup. Suzurkian's gonna win, he's the much better grappler, much better striker, much better fighter in general, and he should win, which is what is reflected by the price tag. The question comes down to 9.8K. Highest salary we've ever seen on DraftKings. How do you fit that into your lineup? How does that play out? Well, I don't know. Uh, and it's gonna be, it's really hard for me to build these lineups and fit him in there, although I am picking some underdogs. He's so hard to get to. Because even if he beats Joe King Silva, does he have a 130 point ceiling? Does he have a higher ceiling than the, the Costas, the Torreses, the Lawrences? I mean, there's so many high uh, ceiling fighters on the slate. Does Suzuki compare at 9.8K? It's pretty tough to say. So I think our modern Suzuki wins this fight a lot of the time. I think he's a great cash safe option, but it's so hard to get to him. They did a, a decent job pricing him out salary wise in terms of bidding hard to get to your lineups and I'm struggling to get him in there, truth be told. I think he's a very live option, but it's hard for me to see him paying off his salary. Give me Sarzukian. He should dominate, should do very well, although it is a question mark into how much I'm getting to him on DraftKings. Main event time, 19-5-1 Marvin Vittori versus the 16-6 Jared Cannonier. Fun main event at 185, but pretty basic one to break down. I mean, Marvin Vittori, brick for a head, um, decent minute winner, decent volume, and doesn't get finished. Whereas Jared Cannonier, a guy who is a ton of power, very explosive, and although he is upping his volume recently, I haven't seen him going out there and, and implement multiple levels to his game. He is a power striker from range a lot of the time, and it's fared him well against these guys who can be knocked out, but how does that fare against a guy in Marvin Torre who's gonna push a pace, throw volume, have some takedown upside here, and who's gonna be there for all 25 minutes? And I gotta stick with the Vittori side. I mean, I don't get the line movement too much here. Um, I know Cannonier is explosive and he has shown decent cardio and volume improvements recently, but Vittori has more levels here in terms of more paths to victory. I think he can cage push. I think he can do some takedown. I think he has more volume. And I think that he's always going to be there. And it's so tough to go out there and beat a guy who can't be knocked out. Uh, I think Vittori is hungry. I think he's going to go in there and I think he's going to win a very, very close fight that's going to last 25 minutes. And if it is going to last 25 minutes, I'm on Vittori's side on DraftKings too. I don't see Kennedy finishing him. And for that reason, without grappling upside, I don't see him having too high of a ceiling. I mean, any of you in his last five round decision, he only scored 86 against Strickland. And with these all these high scoring options this week, really hard for me to take Kennedy here. Whereas Vittori, if he's going 25 minutes, he scored 122 against Costa. He scored 156 against Holland, 128 against Hermanson. We like his volume. We like his durability. We like his floor. We like his ability to go out there. Decent underdog option. I do like Marvin Vittori to win this fight, which should be a very close affair. And I do like him more on DraftKings. But that's going to do it for me here on the Plays and Faith YouTube channel. Quickly, let me give you my quick picks. I'm taking... Maneskis Bukalkis in a very, very close fight. I'm taking Ronnie Lawrence, Teresa Bleda, Zagas Amagulov, Carlos Hernandez in probably the, the hardest fight for me to call due to the unknowns of Bondar, Kung Ho Kang, Alexander Costra, Ronnie Barcelos, Muslim Salikov, Manuel Torres, Lucas Almeida, Armin Petrosian, Armin Tazukian, and Marvin Vittori. A decently fun card here. DraftKings wise, you're gonna have to have the Costa flick fight. You're gonna have to have the Torres Mata fight. And I really like Lawrence. Lawrence is one of my favorite options there. So there are three fights you really want to target. Blada Fernandez is going to be a decent one. Down low, I like Almeida a ton. I think I think Bunez 
uh, Bond or Vittoria are all very, very live options in the mid-range. And then hopefully all the stuff I've said throughout the video is going to help you guys towards your drafting lineup this week. We had a very, very fun slate, a lot of options, a lot of fighters, and I'm feeling pretty good about it. We're on a decent drafting streak, and I do think it's going to be a, another fun one this weekend. Very high scores are coming. Let me say that right now. But I, I am happy to be in front of a can and breaking it down. So um, I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Make sure to hit the like button down below. Subscribe to the channel. I'm doing more work this week, so check that out on Twitter, at Gamblesgordo. Hope everyone enjoys the fights this weekend. Let's make some money, guys.